before we get into the issue of tradition, just on the level of the literal sense of this text in its original context, a few observations that I want to highlight. First, unlike the accounts of the Last Supper in the Gospels, like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the words of institution, Paul's very explicit here that what he's about to tell the Corinthians is something that he's received from someone else, right? So that's what he means when he says, I received from the Lord what I delivered to you. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. Second, notice that Paul gives us here the words of institution, um, but he has something that's actually distinctive about his account. When he's speaking about the cup of the new covenant, he has a clause that he adds in there, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, in the ancient church, that clause, as often as you drink it, actually became a kind of scriptural foundation for the practice of receiving communion under one kind. Because wine was not as readily available in all places as it is to us nowadays, although the Eucharist would be celebrated with bread and wine, it was not the case that there was enough wine to communicate that or to give the, the, the chalice or the cup to everyone participating in it, okay? And so the custom arose fairly early on of reception under one kind, where the faithful would just receive the body of Christ and not drink of the blood of Christ. Although the, the celebrant, the priest, right, would partake of both, the custom arose of the faithful just partaking of one. And there are lots of theological reasons and arguments about that. Um, the Council of Trent actually would eventually have to go on and dogmatically define that whether you receive under one kind or under both kinds, it doesn't matter. You always receive the whole Christ, the total, totus Christus, right? The body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, whether it's under the appearance of bread or under the appearance of wine. But what was interesting is that this particular verse, as often as you drink it, was interpreted as implying that sometimes you would drink it and sometimes you would not. And this gave a kind of basic foundation for the idea or the practice, I should say, of reception under one kind. Um, that's, the, that's the second point. And then the third point about this in its original context that is fascinating is the last line where Paul says, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now the Greek word there, kata angelo, just means to proclaim. But a number of scholars have pointed out that the Hebrew synonym for that word, um, hagada, right, to proclaim or proclamation, is the name of the Passover um, rite or the Passover ritual that would later develop in ancient Judaism and continues to this day. So sometimes we will talk about, in contemporary context, um, a Passover Seder meal, right? That's very common. Um, Seder means order. Okay, so it's the order of the service that will be celebrated at a Jewish Passover. But when you actually get to a Jewish Passover, the description of the ritual is frequently called the Passover Haggadah, which literally means the Passover proclamation. And it has specific reference to the proclamation of certain scriptural texts associated with the Passover from the Old Testament. So scholars have suggested that when Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth, when he says, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, that he's actually drawing there on the language of the Jewish Passover. That just as the Jews proclaimed, or you know, proclaimed the Haggadah, the, the proclamation of what God had done at the time of the Exodus and how he was saving them through the sacrifice of the Passover lamb and through the deliverance under Moses, so too now those who are in Christ are proclaiming the way God delivers them from sin and from death, namely through the death of the Lord, who is the true Passover lamb. And in support of that suggestion, if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul says, For Christ our Passover, or the, that's the Greek word Pascha, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the festival okay? or keep the feast more liberally. So what feast is Paul talking about when he says, let us keep the feast? Well, some people think he means the Passover feast of, of the Jewish people, but in context, it's more likely 
that he's referring to the Eucharistic feast and that he's taking the terminology of Passover and applying it to the, to the Lord's Supper. He's saying, because Christ our Passover has been sacrificed, let us keep the feast of the Lord's Supper, the feast of the Eucharist. All right, so that's just a basic little overview of what he's getting at in this particular passage. Um, oh, by the way, and he says you proclaim it until he comes. So that's another aspect. He connects the Lord's Supper with the second coming of Christ. It's an anticipation, right? It's awaiting the coming of Jesus at the final judgment, which is also like the Jewish Passover, because by the time of Paul in the first century AD, a tradition had arisen that the Messiah would come on Passover night and that he would return at the time of the Passover. Right? So just as the Jews celebrated their Passover meals in partial anticipation of the coming of the Messiah, so now Paul's telling the Corinthians, whenever you celebrate the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, you're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes in the second coming of the Messiah at the end of time. All that. With all that said, um, what about the relationship between Eucharist and tradition? Well, one aspect of Paul's account of the Lord's Supper that's very significant and it's unique to his account is the link between the Eucharist and tradition. Now, you can't see it clearly in your English translation, 